Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Conceive, believe, achieve. Shut the f up. <laughs> You're listening to Believe You Me with Michael the Count Bisbing. You know my name yet? And Anthony Lionheart Smith. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Believe You Me podcast. Anthony Smith, how are you, buddy? Um, I'm all right, Mike. I'm all right. Okay, it's kind of, okay. it's a little bit slow around here. There's not a lot going on. So I've, I feel like I'm a little bit bored. I don't have anything really going on. Well, you can't be as bored as I was Saturday trying to fish. Oh yeah. How'd the <laughs> fishing go? No, didn't even get a bite. So not no catching. One, no catching, nothing. If we were depending on that for a meal, we'd be dead by now. <laughs> You'd be hungry. We have died of starvation. It's funny. We were both just sitting there a second ago saying, how tired we were and how bored we were. But look at this. We turn on the energy straight away. Right. Professionals. Professionals. Well, I think I'm just excited to have something to do right now. <laughs> like, yeah, all right, exactly. cool. We gotta go, I gotta go. Let's go do this podcast. Oh, I know. I know. Cause it's a bit of a slow time in mixed martial arts at the minute. Mm-hmm. Cause and we're, we've got a pay-per-view around the corner. I'm very excited about that. And then we've got lots of big of event, lots of big events coming up, but right now, not too much popping off. We've got fights this weekend though. Moicano, Judo, but what's the main event? The Lidze. Delize and God oh, damn God. it. Oh, no. Not Cannoneer. Oh, God. Harrington, <laughs> jump Imovov. in with your mind. Imovov. Imovov. Yes. Imovov. Imovov. Well, Harrington, you can Imovov off. Um, speaking of the next pay per view, did you see Alexander Volkanovsky with Tom Brady? Yeah, Tom, uh, TB12. Playing catch. Yeah. That was awesome. Let's have a look at the video. We got the UFC. says like, man, I can't make it that easy because they're going to go back and they're like, oh, that was easy. I kind of passed. So sometimes I like to make it a little harder. But not for him because I love him. All right, boy, come on. You got to go right down the middle. Oh, that's, awesome. that's awesome. Where was that? Do you know? I have no idea. Um, I did see it, but it seemed like there was a bunch of super important people in that in that room. So I don't know if it's like a, I don't know, fancy ass. I don't know. Some, I don't know. Tom had one of those little microphones. Maybe he's giving a talk to, I don't know, high performers, high earners. They do it, that kind of stuff. It's pretty like awesome, though, isn't it, to see somebody like Volkanovsky up there mixing it up, playing ball, whatever you want to call it, with mm-hmm. Tom Brady, one of the biggest athletes that we've ever seen. It shows how far the sport of mixed martial arts has come. Um, not surprising he caught that, though. He used to be a professional rugby player before he was a fighter. I right. would have liked to have seen him give it one back. Could you have called that catch, Anthony? Absolutely. I could have caught one hundred percent. One hundred percent. I catch that pass. I would probably. I don't know. I probably be kind of nervous though. Like catching a pass from Tom Brady is a big deal. <laughs> I don't know if I could could have done with the depth perception catching oh, balls. Oh yeah, not easy. <laughs> that would. Yeah, I'll be honest. Even with two eyes, it probably would have still hit me straight in the face. You know what I mean? Because I was never the best at stuff like that. But fair play, Volkanovski. Yeah, that's um, super cool. UFC 298 just around the corner, though, man. When you look at that car, because we haven't spoke about that at mm-hmm. all. Volkanovski, Taporia, Robert Whittaker, uh, Paolo Costa. What else is on there? It's a sick – Henry Cejudo, Marab de Valesvili. Yeah, yeah it's a decent one. card. It's kind of getting overlooked because of the um, – the Duplessis Strickland fight mm-hmm. and then and then 299 and 300 have kind of been taking all the shine. So it is kind of getting overlooked a little bit. It's a decent card, though. Jeff Neal, Ian Machado, Gary. Time there's some heat. There's some, to, yeah, there's some heat there. He's got to back up those words. Got to back up those words. Um, Paolo Costa, Robert Whittaker. We've hardly, I don't think we've spoken about that one time at I, all. I try not to. Why? Because who knows if it's going to happen? It's like the third or fourth time it's been booked. Uh, and stylistically, it's an amazing fight. The, it's a lot of fun and there's a lot of questions there. But I, it's like the third time I've gotten excited about it and not happened. So I, it's like one of those ones that's eluded, that's eluded us. And I just don't, I don't know. Yeah, sometimes it's like you got to just wait until they're walking to get pumped about it. Costa's a bit of a weird one as well, isn't it? Don't get me wrong. I, I love watching him fight. I think he's yeah. very, very entertaining. That yeah. fight he had with Luke Rockhold, entertaining. Marvin Vittori, even though he came, 
came in heavy and had no respect for the weight class, whatever. Still a brilliant fight, you know what I mean? Uh, how do you see that one real quick? Because obviously Whitaker's in the tough place coming back from the loss to Duplessis. Whitaker was always renowned as the next best middleweight after Israel Adesanya. Um, but against Paulo Costa, I think that's a tough matchup for both men. Yeah, I, I do. I think it's a really tough fight for both guys. Uh, Costa, like, Paulo's always going to do well against people that are going to stand in the pocket with him and kind of brawl and bang it out. Um, listen, I, guys, listen, I, I know that everyone's going to get mad at me when I say this, but he, he, Paulo's always been regarded as this crazy heavy hitter, knockout artist. Like, he hasn't knocked out anybody in a while. So, like, he, is coming he coming for you already? Well, is he explosive and aggressive, and he and he does land a lot of big shots? Absolutely, but like, think of the last person he flatlined. It, it's I couldn't even tell you off the top of my head. Like he was in there with Luke. He had Luke Rockhold hurt a couple times, and and wasn't able to put it wasn't able to put him out. Um, he's going to be hard to take down. I think his jujitsu is underrated. Um, but defensively, he does he doesn't move his head a whole lot. He takes a lot of leg kicks. Um, so I, I I think his aggressiveness and his his forward pressure is going to be what wins him the fight if he wins over Robert Whitaker. And if Whitaker can stay on the outside and kind of pick him apart and just stick and move and, and stay safe, I think that he can win. Paolo Costa is only 32 years old. I'm just looking at his record. So to answer your question, decision, win to Rockhold, a loss to Marvin and Adesanya where he was finished, a decision win over Yoel Romero. And that was a very, very entertaining right. fight, by the way. And nobody and knocks out Yoel. <laughs> yeah, no, it ain't easy. Uh, and then a TKO over Uriah Hall, a, mm -hmm. a TKO over Johnny Hendricks, Olawale Bamgoje, and Gareth McLennan. So that's been his UFC run. He hasn't been very active since 2017. Two, mm -hmm. four, eight fights in eight years. Right. And then on that little run he was at with like John, like the one with uh, Johnny Hendricks, like don't get me wrong. I'm not saying he doesn't have power. I'm saying he's not flatlining people where they're like nervous about it. You know what I mean? Like the Johnny Walker thing was kind of a like, or not Johnny Walker, Johnny Hendricks was like an overwhelming, you know, like it was a TKO, but like he's not, he's not, scaring people off as much as I think we... And let's be honest, if I remember rightly, that wasn't big rig championship no. pre-USADA Johnny Walker. Right, right. This you know was post-SADA. <laughs> Looking like a used teabag Johnny Walker. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't right. know what was more impressive. The the downfall of Vito Belfort or Johnny Hendricks. When yeah. USADA came in, my word, my word, what a change. I mean, G Johnny Hendricks was knocking everybody out. One right. shot power. Some amazing fights with Robbie Lawler as well. Uh, George St. Pierre as well. Yeah, but, yeah uh, really good yeah. fight with you. Well, you remember when he, out, when he knocked out when he when he knocked out John Fitch? Like for people that don't know, the canvas oh. is very very rough. Like it's like like mild grain sandpaper. Like you see people's feet, our feet get torn up all the time. People are getting the whole skin ripped off the bottom. It's very rough. He hit John Fitch and knocked him out. And John Fitch slid like eight inches. I was going to say, hit, once he hit the mat, like that, he did. that's so impressive. <laughs> As hard as he, he hit slid it. slid across the canvas. You got to be hitting someone Ow. bloody hard <laughs> to knock them out and then make them slide across the canvas. Um, yeah. Another fight that's on that one as well. Uh, Marad Davalishvili, Henry Cejudo. Interesting fight. Very, very important for that bantamweight division. Did you see the video that Marad put out this week? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Brian, was, please yeah, play brilliant. that for the believers. That was brilliant. Marab's a funny little bastard, man. Is, and that man. was the best way of talking shit without actually talking shit. Look at this cheeky little bastard. I'm back with breaking news, everybody. So we know the champ Sean O'Malley called out number six guy Cheeto to avenge his loss. Of course, Cheeto Vera will beat skinny guy again and he will become UFC new champ. Already, Cheeto Vera called out number four Corey Sahengan to avenge his loss. I wanna kick out Corey Sahengan. Of course, Corey will beat Cheeto again and he will become UFC new champ. And Corey will call out number five Peter to get his loss back. Peter will win against Corey again. And Peter will call number two this handsome guy. And of course, this handsome guy will beat Peter again. <laughs> he, said, he said, Peter will beat this skinny guy. <laughs> I like his logic. Yeah. Apart from, I don't know if P.O.D. Yan's going to beat um, Corey Sandagan again. 
No, no, probably not. That's a, that's the one that really throws you off. Like that's, that's yeah. the one I'm not so sure about. Well, um, and on, I sorry. don't know that Peter Yan calls out Marab. Even if Marab beats you, you probably don't want to do it again. Nobody's calling out Marab. No. Cause it, like, no. he's, I'm trying to think of someone that like in another division or, or that, that is comparable. Like, I don't know, like maybe a Damian Maya or a Ben Askren. We're like, they're not going to hurt you. And you, they're not like scary. Like you're not going to leave there injured probably, but it's such a frustrating, frustrating way to fight. Like you can't get them off of you. They're really good at what they do. They don't, you can't deviate them from their game plan. It's a f- impossible style to deal with. It's exhausting. So even if you win the fight portion of it, like they may still win the competition. Mm. Yeah, and he just never gets tired as well. Marab just keeps coming forward, never gets tired. Ridiculous wrestling, strong as an ox. Not a bad little striker, far from it. Out of all those matchups, though, I mean, yeah, okay. I see the argument for why Cheeto... uh, I I see why he thinks he beats O'Malley, because he has done once already, even though that's not guaranteed. Sandegan beating Vera, not guaranteed. But again, you see the logic. You can Mm -hmm. go through with all of them, but... Yeah, I don't see that last one. I do, do not see Piotr Jan beating Corey Sandhagen. If anyone's going to stick hold or grab hold or maintain is the word I'm looking for, that belt and go on a run out of all of them, and this is no disrespect to any of them, Corey Sandhagen is the most complete out of all of them with the toe, with the range, with just the skill set that he's got and the mind that he has for mixed martial arts. Again, no disrespect to the champ, to the contender, Sean O'Malley, but Corey Sandhagen looks like he's going to be a problem for a long time. Well, he's the he's like you said, he's the most well-rounded one. You know, if you can look at all those guys and and formulate a way to beat to beat them and get them get them out of their game fairly easily. You not that you can beat them easily, but you can figure you can pinpoint that that kind of path that you would probably go if you're fighting O'Malley. You're, if you're a powerful wrestler and you can get takedowns, you can probably beat O'Malley. If you can defend the takedowns, keep Marab off of you, you can probably beat Marab. You know, if you can take down Cheeto, we've seen it happen. As much as we don't like it, we've seen people been able to control him. I don't really see that with Corey Sandhagen. If you take him mm-hmm. down, he's dangerous off his back. He's hard to take down. He sweeps well. He gets up well. You definitely don't want to be stuck on your feet with that dude for too long. So uh, I, I definitely agree with you. Are you working that event? Uh, no, I actually have that one off. God damn. I'm going to be there. I'm gonna. It's Anaheim. It's my back garden. I'm, yeah, I'm commentating yeah. the event. I was hoping you'd do the desk. Maybe we'll grab a little steak or something afterwards. Right. Like a civilized gentleman. A steak and a mule. And a Moscow mule through a straw. Oh, my God. Right on cue. Mm-hmm. No way. Is that a Moscow mule? With a straw. It, with a straw. I'll let it go because that's your vibe. That's your thing. That's my um, thing. This is me. <laughs> A little early in the day, Mr. Smith. No, you're in a different time zone, remember? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's three o'clock. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's 324. Jesus Christ, let's go mental. Yeah. Oh, dear. So that's the next pay-per-view. The last pay-per-view, as we know, was no. That was weird. Uh, Sean Strickland, Drickus Duplessis. A lot of fallout, right? John Anik is... It was annoyed with the fan base and it came out, he kind of apologized. We talked about it on the last one with Kenny Florian, so I'm not going to get into that one too much. But um, Drickus Duplessis came out and said, I don't know if you saw this, that Sean said to him or he admitted that he felt like Drickus Duplessis won the fight. Harrington, have you got the exact quote or do we have a video that we can play just to give some context as a conversation point? Because I've got some opinions on this. Uh, I don't have the video. I have the quote, though. Uh, he yeah. said he came in the cage directly before they announced me as the new champion. I went to him. I shook his hand. And I said, you're a warrior. Well done. That was a great fight. And he said, no, you definitely beat me. Uh, he said to me, you deserve it. You won that fight. You beat me. And I said, I also think so. I have to agree with you on that. After I won the fight, you could see in his face. He knew when the ref held our hands, he knew he wasn't winning that fight. What's your initial thoughts, Anthony, on that? I think... When you get into a fight that close, I don't think you always know. Like, I think sometimes, especially depending on how the end of the fight went or the last couple rounds, sometimes you're way, like, I've been in fights where I felt like, man, I I lost, I definitely lost that round. And then I go back and watch it, and it was a dominant win. It wasn't even close. So when I was in that fight with Ryan Spann, going into the third round, uh, I, I remember looking at Mark and being like, 
I know, I know, I know. I need to finish. And he was like, finish? You don't need to finish. You need to win this round. That's it. You win the round, you win. And I was like, really? Like in my head, I had like lost the first two rounds. Obviously, I lost the second, but the first in my head, for some reason, I thought I lost it. Um, so I wonder if maybe that that was something going on in Sean's head. And then when he went back, kind of digested it, watched it a little bit and said, no, 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 no. I won that fight. Yeah, I mean, we're not Sean Strickland, so we don't right. know what he's thinking. I haven't had a conversation with the guy. At times like that, that's kind of when you're at your most honest regarding mm-hmm. the performance, because in yourself, it's you know, you feel that maybe he he lost the fight, and that's probably because. He, he wasn't as effective or as successful as he wanted to be. Going into it, you're full of confidence. You think, here's what I'm going to do. Here's how the fight's going to play out. And it ended up a lot closer. So in your mind, you know, you might be thinking all doom and gloom, or you might be on the other side and think, shit, I've got this, I've got this. But he said that to Drakus, and then obviously he's watched the fight back because he came out and, you know, he's, he's uh, said that he disagrees with it, shall we say. Uh, but it's just, I don't think you can put too much stock into that into right. what Drickers is saying. I mean, yes, he said that. And that was very honest of Sean. Like I was, I, I had the same thing when I fought Chael Sonnen in Chicago. Uh, I lost the fight, right? By decision, very close one. But before they read out the announcement, I went over to Chael. I said, what do you think? And he said, and I always respect to Chael for this. He said, I think you got it. I think you got it two rounds to one, you know? I didn't go out there. I'm not talking shit about Drickers, by the way. I think he's great. I didn't go out there and do lots of interviews and say, well, Jail's fucking even said he right. thinks that I won. You know, I mean, it's one of those fights. It could have gone either way. But uh, if I'm Drickers, I'm doing the same thing, though, because Sean came out, talked a bit of shit, said it was a headbutt and all the rest. Me and Jail, I don't think we ever spoke to each other again for years. You know, and this is... It wasn't pre-social media, but it wasn't as big as what it is now. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? The sport wasn't as big. We weren't doing podcasts and interviews every five fucking minutes. You know what I mean? So it just wasn't spoke about. But I guess if Chael went out there and started talking shit, I'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on a minute, buddy. You told me to my face. So anyway, the fact that you and Chael have never had like any real serious beef <laughs> is shocking to me. It it's is. So, it's so shocking. Not only did you fight, <laughs> and both you guys were, had no problem being all up in someone's face when you fought, but it was short notice. So you didn't have the chance. There was no controversy afterwards. You've been really like, you guys have always been like respectful of each other, but you could not be two totally different people. Oh, God. Like, I know. It's, it's yep. so crazy how polar opposites of humans you are. It's insane. But no, 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 you're right because Chael's not afraid to speak his mind mm-hmm. and I'm not. So typically people like that clash in society. That's just the way it goes. You know, often I'm not saying Chael's like me because, because he's not at all, but often two people that are like that, they clash regardless. Yeah. Um, whenever I see Chael, cause you see him in the UFC, brilliant on the microphone. Mm-hmm. Just, he was phenomenal, phenomenal on the mic, a fantastic fighter as well. But in this day-to-day life, the version of Chael Sonnen that I see, you know, you see him with the glasses on, yeah. you know, and he's, on the he's tip quiet. Of his nose, on the tip of his nose. Yeah, looking Super like quiet. a granddad. He can barely look at Can He's like you're trying to figure out how far to put the phone from his face. <laughs> he's so quiet yeah. and sweet. He doesn't say a word. He doesn't mm. say a word. He doesn't say boo to a goose. And then they say, actually, he goes, I'll tell you what it is. And then he <laughs> comes out of his shell and gets all animated. So, yeah, no, no, no. Um it's weird. People always said they thought we would have this big war of words, but it was too short. It was too late notice for that to even happen. And then I didn't see him again for ages. I remember the first time when I went into, um, cause we fought at the, is it the United center where the Chicago Bulls play? Mm-hmm. And I got flew up there to do like a pre-fight press conference. And I went into like the dressing room for the basketball team to wait for my time to go out. And when I walked in, there's Chael and I never met him before. And he was so nice. He was sitting in like the corner of the room, just like, I don't know, reading a newspaper or something. Mm-hmm. And he came over and I'm a buddy Jacko with me. We were hung over to the max. Right? <laughs> We'd flown up to Chicago for a press conference. Yeah, right. We were on the piss. Uh, we walked in still stinking of alcohol. Chell gets up and he was just so nice and mm-hmm. so like respectful and just like talking about the weather and stuff like that. I'm like, how can you? Talk. Sh- oh, no, no. Sorry. What am I saying? No, no, no. He was fighting, I think, Mark Munoz originally. I had mm-hmm. a different opponent, but still. We but you both were on the same card. We were on the same card. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's when we first met. And he was just so <clears> nice. He was so polite. So when the fight was announced, I was like, how do we talk shit? He just seems like a 
That's somebody's dad. And he's like, yeah, he's like, a, I always say, like, oh, everyone calls him Uncle Chael. I his old Grandpa Chael. Yeah. Grandpa Chael. Oh, Shout grandpa out, Chael. Chael. Hope you're well, buddy. And you know, by the way, Chael Sonnen just came out. I don't know if you saw, there was some sparring footage of Conor McGregor. Did you see that, Anthony? No, I didn't. Yeah, some sparring footage of Conor. And Conor looked all right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Didn't look like, um, you know, the, the best thing you've ever seen. He didn't look bad. It just looked like two guys having a little sparring session. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And he looked all right. Just in the gym, mm -hmm. having a move around, something like that. Oh, here we are here. There's Conor with the, the tricolor uh, guard on. He's right. got the headgear on. That looks like Conor McGregor, right? The way yeah. he's winging his punches. Is that on his yacht? <laughs> that's not on the yacht. That that's not on the yacht. But um, Chael Sonnen came out and he did a video, and maybe Harrington will uh, have the exact quote. He says that that's not Conor McGregor. He says that he's too covered up. It's not Conor McGregor. He doesn't move like Conor McGregor. So Chael is basically accusing Conor of putting out deep fake AI <laughs> sparring footage to con the world that he's in training. That that's the most chill son and shit in the world. That yeah. looks just like Connor. It Connor. That's because it is Connor. <laughs> yeah, that's because I mean, it's Connor. That could be why. why. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why Chael's saying this. I mean, he, he is sometimes, out of his mind. Sometimes Chael comes up with shit that, like, you know, he doesn't believe, but he just has to go with it. Like he's that's just what trying I'm, to get the clicks. Yeah, and it works. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking about it. I know. Uh, speaking of Connor. Um, Michael Chandler was talking about their fight and I forget what he was saying. He was talking about him not training or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, he's just always on his yacht where I'm living in the gym. And Connor yeah. comes back, gym has yacht. Oh, no, no, <laughs> yacht. no, yacht has gym. Yeah, he should get off the <laughs> yacht, kid. Yacht yeah, has gym. <laughs> Brian, do we have that, the exact quote from Michael Chandler? Because uh, to be fair, that was a great comeback from McGregor. Or what does Chandler say? He says, I get it. He's coming off an injury. So that said, now that Notorious is healthy, the question is, why wouldn't it be UFC 300? It's been two and a half years. Get off the yacht, kid. And then McGregor comes back with wherever it is. Yacht has gym. <laughs> there it is. Yacht has gym. <laughs> He's yeah, a funny little uh, bastard at times. You got to give it to him. And it's quick. I like those like quick, yeah. short, yeah. little, little jabs. Straight to the point. Yeah. Yeah. A to gym. B, like a hard, fast jab. All right. This episode is sponsored by Buy Optimizers. Look, listen, you don't know this, but you are not getting enough magnesium in your body because. Four out of five Americans, they just aren't. And that's a big problem because magnesium is involved in more than 300 biochemical reactions inside your body. So today, I want to talk to you about the most common signs to look out for that could indicate that you are magnesium deficient. Listen carefully at the end because there is a special offer happening and this could be exactly what you need. Here we go. Are you irritable or anxious? Do you struggle with insomnia? Do you experience muscle cramps or twitches? Do you have high blood pressure? And are you sometimes constipated? There are dozens of symptoms of magnesium deficiency. So these are just a few of the most common ones. Now, here's what most people don't know. Taking just any magnesium supplement doesn't solve the problem because most supplements use the cheapest kind that your body can't use or can't absorb. So that is why I exclusively recommend Magnesium Breakthrough. It is the only full spectrum magnesium supplement with seven unique forms of magnesium that your body can actually use and then absorb. All bioptimizers supplements are the best in class. And if for some reason you feel differently, you can get a full refund. No questions asked. And they are so confident that they offer you a 365 day. That's a full year money back guarantee. All you got to do is go to biooptimizers.com slash BYM. In addition to the discount you get by using the promo code BYM10, you can get free gifts with purchases up to two travel size bottles of magnesium breakthrough. Act fast because this is a limited time offer. So right now go to biooptimizers.com slash BYM. In addition to the discount you get by using the code BYM10, you can get gifts with purchase up to two travel size bottles of magnesium breakthrough. So act fast because this is a limited time offer. Right now, go to bioptimizers.com slash BYM. BYM10 is the code. And get free gifts. Um, Harrington, 
Uh, well, well, first of all, let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought about base jumping, Anthony? Absolutely. Are you serious? Yeah. Would you do base jumping? 100%. Really? Yeah. Like, why? I, I don't know. There's a couple real crazy things I want to do. Oh, some of them are not so crazy, but skydive is I one wanna, of them you've said. I want to skydive without a parachute. I want without a parachute. Okay. Yeah, without a parachute. Um, I think Travis Pastrana did it way back in the day. It was a Red has, Bull commercial. Yeah, where he just has a harness and then a professional skydiver fly, like skydives to you in the air and then hooks to you. Um, you'd really could have to be, trust somebody. <laughs> that could be labeled as assisted suicide. It just could be. That out yeah. there. You know, I, I think. What do you, I think base jumping would be sweet. Um, I don't know. I just want. I don't know. I just want to do some crazy shit. I want to scuba yeah, yeah, dive too, which is not. I'm getting ready to take some scuba diving classes. So there's that. Just don't scuba dive with your child when he's ten years old and won't listen to the uh, instructions at all. What is this? What are we looking at here? Oh, this is uh, this is the Red Bull commercial. Look at him. He's not wearing anything though. I think he puts the harness on in the air. Oh my god. Oh yeah. my god! Insane. That guy's got some real balls. He's no crazy. man alive. He's crazy. Should jump out of an airplane with no parachute. That's insane. Look at that shit. I mean, okay, because he's with a lot of professionals, so he knows they're going to come and grab hold of him. Could you imagine that thrill, that rush? Which is, I'm assuming, why you want to do things like base jumping. Right. Yeah. The, yeah. The rush. Did you go well, scuba diving with a ten year old that doesn't listen? I went scuba diving, diving with Lucas in Mexico. They don't follow the f rules. Steve or and Tiny, you know, the British uh, security yeah. guys for the UFC. Tiny mm -hmm. used to be a scuba dive instructor. And he told me uh, that Lucas, when he was scuba diving, should not have been at those depths um, until you've had like X amount hours of training. Right. Uh, it's a long story. I told it all on the podcast when I first did it. It's a long story, but I was freaking the hell out. I almost had a fight with the guys and I looked around and Lucas just jumped in. Uh, so I'm like, shit. So I jump in after him and I get him and I go up, up, up. So we go back up the rope and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, son, we need to go through the safety protocol. This mm -hmm. means good. That means bad. And he's like, yeah, I get it, dad. Right. And then the, the Mexican dude's like, you got to go. You got to go. There's people waiting. And Lucas was looking at me like almost in tears as if, as if to say, I'm very excited to do this dad please don't take this away because the scuba diver guy's like you go now or you're getting out so oh, oh. No. so we go down to the bottom of the ocean right oh. and everyone else everyone else is just like there's a little trickle of bubbles mm -hmm. coming out of their mouth mine is like there's a volcano going off because i'm freaking out like crazy the guy's like are you okay i'm like i'm fine but it's just my son and every time i look around he's like bloody 50 yards away. I was like, just stay with me. Stay with me. Uh, it was terrifying, right? Oh, yeah. So don't do it with your kid. No, not at all. Base jumping. Would. You know you can die? I've heard. Yeah. Well, Harrington's got a story for you. Uh, yeah, so there was a British base jumper. Uh, this is like his, his whole thing. 33 years old. Uh, has been doing it all over the world. Uh, this uh, was off of a skyscraper in Thailand. Um, he went for it, and it did not uh, did not end well for him. Um, you can see, uh, yeah, here we go. So 33-year-old jumps from a building, um, and the police said, eyewitnesses said they saw something hit those trees right there, uh, and then when they found the body, there was a blue parachute that had failed to open. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a problem. So when you hear stuff like that, would that put you off trying base jumping? Let's just say it was all lined up. I gave you a call. Hey, guys, we're going to get the jet. We're going to fly out to Thailand. We're going to jump off a skyscraper. And you just saw that video. Would you think, ah, it's all right. You can get hit by a car crossing the road. Or would you say, nah, let's do it. Let's go. Let's let's jump some base. Um, You know, I, I've had some opportunities to do some of the things I really want to do. And when it comes down to planning it, I have – chosen not to a couple times partially because i have kids once yeah. it's not about me or my life i'm not afraid of that i just can't leave my family until they're ready until my family is like good on their own then i'll do whatever the hell i want but that that's the one thing that gives me pause and a lot of the dumb shit that i want to do yeah, no, you're right, because at some point it becomes very, very selfish. Very. Very selfish. If you're going to jeopardize being the head of the family, being the breadwinner, the man right. that brings home the bacon, and you're going to potentially risk your own life for the thrill. 
And the thrill of jumping off a skyscraper, I'm sure it's great, but how good can it be? Is it worth risking your life? And me and Brian were talking about uh, this probably. before. Probably. I don't know. All it takes is one big gust of wind before you open your parachute, yeah. Yeah. blow you into the side of the building. Is it worth it for the amount of time that it's incredible? That's where yeah, I'm look, That's where I'm at. It's only a few seconds. Squished on the floor like a pad thai. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, do you man. love some Thai food, though? Yeah. Uh, no, I wouldn't do it. I bungee jumped, but that was kind of lame. Was it? Wasn't that great? I, I, it, I mean, I shit my pants. I did it. I was very hungover as well. This is a long time ago. We'd had a heavy night with the boys, and I signed up for it for charity. And I'm like, it was five in the morning. I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah. I'm bungee jumping off the top of a church in the morning. And everyone's oh. like, what do you mean? And I couldn't pull out of it because I signed up to it through Red Rose Rock FM, the local radio station, mm -hmm. thinking I'll get a free bungee jump out of this. And I did get a free bungee jump, but I shit my pants. But, yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, like been there, done that. Better ways to spend a Saturday morning when you're very, very hungover and green around the gills. That's for damn sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So anyway, um, the rules of a downed opponent have changed once again. I think we finally got it right. <laughs> I think we got it right. Uh, so, as you may or may not know, it used to be if you were on your hands, that was a downed opponent. Then it became if it was weight-bearing. Then it became if you lift the guy up and hoist his uh, hand off the ground temporarily, then you could knee him in the head. I think we were talking about this last week, weren't we? We were. Was it us? Yeah. 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 So the, uh, the California State Athletic Commission have ruled now that never mind that any of this weight-bearing nonsense, if any part of your body other than your feet or your hands is touching the ground, a knee, a shin, a shoulder, your belly, whatever it is, if anything else is touching the ground, that is a downed opponent and you cannot knee them. If, if it's just your hands or your feet, you can still knee them in the head, right? Yeah. I think you can knee and kick to the head, which I think is perfect. Unless you're, you get caught in the push up position. <laughs> I don't know. For some reason, I don't know why you would be in a fight. A millimeter but, off the ground. Yeah. Then that would suck. But I, I think that's right. I think we finally got it right. I, I don't like the game of trying to like, put the hand in the, like, you know, people are playing the game and, and getting away with stuff. I, I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I think it's a very, very important rule change. Yes, Brian. So that's the California State Athletic, Athletic Commission. Is that reciprocal around the country? Most well, states will, will adopt the rules of California. Not all. Every once in a while, we'll go to a state that doesn't. Like Texas kind of does their own thing. They don't like following anyone else's rules. So they're kind of a little bit archaic in that that aspect. Um, they do whatever they want. They're putting razor wire at the border, and they say F the government. Yeah, no, they are pretty <laughs> crazy. Um, so, like, there's a few states that don't immediately adopt it, but for the most part, every state will adopt that. Not every, but for most of them will. No, it, it is good. It is good because it just gets rid of any kind of mistakes, as we said. And I, I apologize if we're repeating an older conversation. There's still a few others. Is there any other rules that you'd like to see implemented? Rogan's a big proponent of this one. And I kind of agree. The 12 to 6 elbows. I think that's that, part of this, too. Oh, that, is it really? I think they're adding that. I think those are the two rule changes they're proposing. Is oh, the down fantastic. opponent rules and abolishing the 12 to 6 elbow. So that that's 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 obviously one for me. Yeah, yeah. Other than that, there's nothing that really stands out too much. But they're the two big glaring ones. I think it was it was Rogan that said apparently when they were writing the rule books, they saw a martial artist smashing a piece of ice mm -hmm. with a twelve to six elbow, and they were like, "Oh, no <laughs> Can't way! Can't do that! Can't do that! That's way too dangerous!" You know what I mean? You can generate way more power with a standing elbow, mm -hmm. rotating your hips into it, using your body weight, and all the rest of it. So that's good. Um, will John Jones have that disqualification overturned? Unlikely, because I, no, I mean won't. you're kind of still stuck there. But no, I know. Uh, actually, with the rule change to the to the downed opponent. It would have made the knee that he hit me with not illegal anymore. Oh, well, I was on my knee. I was going to say hands. you were on your knees. I was on my knees and my hands. But as as he threw the knee, I started to come up. So my hands were still down, and my knee had just come off the canvas. So 
technically when it landed i was when he threw it i was down when he when it mm -hmm. landed with the new rule change i wouldn't have been a down opponent anymore okay okay so what are we saying do you still cheat <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know where to go with that man so what are we saying no. oh dear no, Harrington, give us a give us a mixed martial arts story and how the hell are you brother uh i am doing excellent as far as uh, news in the mixed martial arts world. Uh, how about this one? I saw this one this morning. Alex Pereira. He he put out some footage of him. He's with a striking coach. He's training. Interestingly, though, when he reposted to his story, he posted his own weight, 91 kilograms, which, you know, for us American people is about 200 pounds. That's a weird weight for the 205 pound champion of the world to be walking around at. And it's led people to question, is he preparing for a cut down to 185? Well, it's a very surprising weight as was well. He on, was he, did you see him on a scale? No, but he did look, I mean, uh, Brian, if you can pull up the, the, the video, he does look pretty damn slim uh, in the video that he posted here. So you basically what you're saying is that you think that he's working his way down to 185 pounds, probably to fight Drickers Duplessis in the main event of UFC 300. Is that where you're going with that, Harrington? I mean, that's champion versus champion. Could you think of a more wow factor fight? Yeah, I could think of a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great that's a great fight, but I, I just don't think he's 200 pounds. I just seen him last weekend. Yeah. He's no, that's why I said that's surprising. Yeah, he's not 200 pounds. He can Where lie did you see him at the weekend? Toronto. Oh, oh, you mean for the fight? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Last yeah. weekend. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, 200 pounds. I mean, that's crazy because when I used to die. When he was 85, he wasn't under 200 pounds. He wasn't even when I was fighting 85, if I dieted down to 200 pounds, fight week, You're I knew struggling. it was good. Right. No, no, no. That, that was were my goal. Right. That was my goal, to get to 200 pounds. So he's right there. He's on weight. He can make weight by Friday. If he's mm -hmm. 200 pounds today, he can make 185 by Friday. No problem whatsoever. So I also have a hard time because right. he's a gigantic human being. He is. I bet he's not 200 pounds until Wednesday of fight week when he is cutting to 85. Like Wednesday or mm -hmm. Thursday, I bet. Yeah. yeah when I, right, even no. when I was fighting at 85, I wasn't under 200 until Wednesday or Thursday. So are we officially saying that Harrington's full of shit and leading us down a liar. garden path Harrington, that we should Harrington not be walking liar. down? I would be yeah. cool though. That would be kind of a that'd be a little that'd be some shock and awe. That'd be a big surprise. That's for I'll sure. give you some I'll give you some shock and awe. Okay. You ever wear an earring? I used to, yeah, when I was younger. I knew you would. I knew you would. Yeah. I've never other than waking up really hungover in my bed. When I was about 16 and going, hold on, did I get my ears pierced last night? And feeling, I'm like, oh, and I did. My girlfriend at the time pierced my ears with her earring in a phone booth and, and put an <laughs> earring and I'll walk in. I woke up in bed with a earring and I'm like, oh, shit. And I wouldn't go downstairs. It took me forever trying to figure out how to take the bastard out. Um, can a man that wears an earring beat one of the greatest boxers on planet Earth? Can't, Do you know where I'm going with this? I don't. No. Let me give you a clue. Okay. No man alive can beat. No, I will not lose a fight to a man that wears an earring. <laughs> Brian, just Google Tyson Fury earring Alexander Usyk. They had a face to face. They had a sit down. Right. Alexander uh -huh. Usyk's a great fighter. Uh, find the video, Brian. There's a good video on it. Uh, obviously, they're fighting in Saudi Arabia in just mm -hmm. a few weeks. Same night as UFC 298, actually, which is a bit of a shame because uh, I wanted to watch it. Um, Tyson Fury is saying because Alexander Usyk wears an earring, he he's won't got beat no him. chance of beating <laughs> him. <laughs> he comes up with some of those ridiculous shit. Yeah, and my mom got my ear, my mom got my ear pierced when I was a little kid. Like I didn't really yeah. have a choice. You know, I was just I was super fly though. I was picking yeah, up all the I, chicks on the playground. At what age did you stop wearing the earring? Oh, eight or nine. All right, so as a grown man or as a young man? Yeah, never as a grown man. Callum had earrings when he came back from college one day. Bearing in mind, he's at college in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And he had two earrings in, two studs. Whoa, what'd you say? Yeah, 
<laughs> what you say? What the fuck? No man alive should be walking into my house with two <laughs> earrings. Do you know what I mean? Brian, do we have that video, buddy? I know he can't beat me. A man who wears an earring in his ear can never beat Tyson Fury. Ever. Not a chance. No one who wears earrings can beat me. Я можу пояснити, що це таке. It's Ukrainian warrior. Козак. Це ті люди, які боронили мою країну багато років від ворога. Тут тільки підтвердження мого козацького роду. Вони нікому не програвали. Тут нема красоти чи моди. Listen, in Ukraine, it means he's a good fighting man for him. But where I'm from, it means he's a veneering him. <laughs> that's a pretty good comeback from Usyk though like way to just like really I don't know someone makes fun you ever like flip someone some shit on something and, or yeah. about something and they hit you with something like oh well I, I got that for my for my mom that just passed away like ah oh. you know then you look yeah. like an asshole that's kind of what he yeah. did no no absolutely it's a good way of doing it uh, anyway should we talk about uh, real quick Usyk Fury. Do you have an opinion on that fight? Do, do, do you watch Usyk? Do you know much about him? If Usyk can't beat him, no one right now can. I th- no I man think alive. Usyk's, no man alive. Right, not right now. Uh, I think he can beat him, though. I think he does. I think he can. Yeah. I think I think he does. I, and this is not because of Francis Ngannou. I think when you look at Tyson Fury, who's incredible, He's big, he's fast, he's athletic. Uh, he didn't look good against Francis Ngannou. But when you look at the other fights before that, he's looked incredible. But the question is, how good is some of the opposition? Because he was kind of going around in a circle and fighting the same people. He beat Klitschko when Klitschko was at the end of his career. Was it Derek Chisora? He fought him three times. Deontay mm-hmm. Wilder hasn't really panned out to be that good anyway. Right. He hasn't fought well, he's not a great bo- and He's not a great boxer. Yeah. You know, uh, here, uh, here's how I look at it. I think that the the Francis and Ghana fight could really, really come back and bite Tyson Fury in the ass. Not because of how he fought or how he looked. I'm not even looking at that part of it yet. But the time that he could have been, he could have been preparing for Usyk and then just fought Francis. Is that, you get where I'm going? Like, yeah, he could yeah. have just been, I'm going to be in the gym. I'm going to be working. I'm going to be trying to get better. I'll get my weight down. I'm going to be get, getting good shape physically. I'm going to get strong and fit. And then dur- and then I'll fight Francis. And then I'll take a little bit of a break. And then I'll continue the work that I was doing for Usyk. He didn't do that. He prepared for Francis and Ganu. So even if we're saying his, his preparation wasn't the best it could have been, because physically he did look soft and heavy and didn't look great. Then it, now he's preparing for Usyk, but he started in a worse spot than he could have been. Had he just gotten in really good shape, fought Francis, and then moved on, even if the fight went the exact same way, at least physically he's in a better spot. So now he's he just didn't he started at a at a worse spot than he probably could have been. Well, I don't think he really trained for Francis Ngannou, even though he says that he did, right? Because he looked bad, right? And I'm not he taking did. away from Ngannou, but when you look at Usyk. He's incredible, man. The speed yeah. of that guy. And he's not that small because they had a face-off uh, as well a couple of days ago or last week, whatever it was. I saw it this morning. And they're head-to-head. They're like, you know, pushing heads, you know, like they do. And he's going, ah, sausage, sausage, this, sausage, that, and all the rest of it. <laughs> Why does he always call uh, people sausage? All, always with the sausage. He loves a good sausage, does Tyson. Uh, and But Usyk, yeah, of course, he's not the same size. He's the smaller man, but he's not tiny. He's not no. a small he's guy. He's not a little guy. He's not a little guy, right? Mm-hmm. And he's phenomenal. I mean, he was an Olympic gold medalist. I believe he was a world champion, a European champion. He's undefeated. The speed of the man, the head movement, the footwork, you put it all together. He's a real boxer. And generally, because he is the smaller guy in the heavyweight boxing division, he's always the game plan's the same. Take away the height and the reach. Right? When mm-hmm. he fought Anthony Joshua, stay in the pocket, head movement, use those jabs, the right hands, the left hands, get on the inside and nonstop pressure. And that's the way he always fights. Right. So he's going to, I think it's a harder fight for Tyson than what it is. Absolutely. For Usyk. Absolutely. And I, don't, I just think, I just, uh, Tyson's going to have a tough time keeping him out of the pocket. I really do. Mm. And he's got good movement. If Tyson can't do it, nobody can. That, that's yeah, kind of how I look at it. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting there saying that Tyson can't do it. I really, really enjoy Tyson Fury, and I find oh, yeah. his story to be very inspirational. All jokes aside, and the no man alive, and his crazy dad, and all the rest of it. I think they're value for money. Great yeah. entertainment, and certainly in the ring, they're brilliant. And John Fury, what a f- legend! <laughs> I know. He, if we could just get him matched up with Mike Tyson. And oh just get this God, over. I would. 
just get him on the podcast. Yeah, let's, we we should get John Fury on the podcast. Let's get John Fury on the podcast. No man alive. I'll just talk to him like this for three hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh dear! Can um, we please do that? I know. I know. God, please. The mayor of Manchester. <laughs> yeah. If anyone knows him, reach Big out. Tom, Big Tom, come on. You got the Big connections the with man. the Furies. Big Tom is the man to make it happen. He Speaking is. of Tom, he's called out the winner of Jalton Almeida and Curtis Blades. I love it. Logical. Love that. Love that. All right, today's episode is sponsored by Tushy. And let me tell you, I do love a good Tushy. What I'm talking about is a B-Day. Instead of your regular old, regular old toilet seat, instead of using paper, dry paper, to wipe your backside when you're done, no, 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 Tushy, make it easy. It, it will clean your butt. It will get rid of the bacteria. It will smoothen the deposit into the bowl. And let me tell you, every toilet in the Bisping household is fitted with a Tushy B-Day. They are so easy to set up that even I can do it in under 10 minutes. You can set up your home B-Day that will change your life forever. And I'm not kidding. I'm telling you, these things are great. If you are struggling to make a deposit, this thing smoothens it. It makes it easy to go. It gets rid of all bacteria. It's just clean, right? Taking a piece of dry toilet paper and wiping your backside with that. Once you've used this thing, that will seem like you're in the stone age. Okay. People in the future are going to laugh. They're going to say, what the hell were these people doing? Right? Why would they not use a B-Day? On top of that, if you're environmental friendly, it's no secret that toilet paper is bad for the environment. It's estimated that toilet paper accounts for 15% of the deforestation each year. And with Tushy, you can use 75% less toilet paper on average. The Tushy B Day also stays clean and hygienic with its patented self cleaning smart spray. The nozzle self cleans before and after each use automatically. The buildup resistant design helps to minimize grime buildup and it even has antimicrobial knobs. The B Day stays clean just like your backside, okay? And every Tushy B-Day comes with a 30-day hassle-free return and a 12-month warranty. It's risk-free to join the over 3 million people that are pooping in style who have made the switch to a cleaner and more confident backside. So, listen, if you haven't got one of these, give it a try. 2024, what are you waiting for? It's not the 50s, 60s, 70s. It's 2024. Go to the toilet properly. Do it in style. Impress your guests. But more importantly, just clean yourself out, okay? Right now, go to hellotushy.com. For a limited time, you will get 10% off your entire order when you use the code BISPING at checkout. That is 10% off your order when you go to hellotushy.com and use the promo code BELIEVE. It's time to back your ass up with confidence. Here's something you might not love. Hmm. Jamal Hill isn't happy. Harrington or Brian be ready with the video or the quote or whatever it is. He's not happy and he's feeling disrespected because when he became champion of the world, he wasn't as high on the pound for pound list as he would have hoped. Um, do we have the exact quote? So here it is. Jamal says, when I won the title, I can't think, think, are the last time somebody became a champion and they were ranked outside of the top 10 pound for pound rankings. Go look at anybody else who's won a title. Sean O'Malley, it doesn't matter who it is. They were in the top 10. I'm disrespected in every aspect. It's got me up all over the place, but it is what it is. People look at it like I'm a knockout guy, but I'm a martial artist and I'm a champion for a reason. Your thoughts, Anthony Smith? Oh, well, well, again, we all know my relationship with Jamal. Uh, I don't know exactly. I, he was in the pound for pound rankings. He's just not in the top 10. So I, I believe he, you talk. I, I believe that he had moved him into the pound for pound. I don't know if he still is because of the injury, but I do believe he was in it. it just wasn't in the top 10. So uh, the problem is, is he didn't have enough time to like really spend it with the title. And I think it says, less, I think it's less about the disrespect of, Jamal, but more how people felt about Glover Teixeira. I Glover was a was forty three, I think, when Jamal beat him. Now us in the sport, the guys that like you know you, the you and me and and everyone else, we know how dangerous Glover is and how good that guy is. 
But if you if you're just a media guy and you're doing all the voting on these pound for pound lists, like that's a 43 year old man that's at the end of his career, and it was on short notice. Neither guy had a whole like th- that's how they justify this stuff. It was on short notice. He he, you know, he fought the older man, and th- and that's how they look at it. So I I understand Jamal and why he's upset about that. <laughs> but also on the flip side of it, he had just won the title and he never had an opportunity to prove where I think he probably is on the pound for pound rankings, like where me and him think he is and, and where he was able to prove with, with actual data in the octagon are different. I know where he's at, but mm. no one else does. So you gotta, you gotta put the work in, you gotta fight the fights, you gotta beat the people and the injury just cut his cut, you know, cut his title range short. And, and when he gets back and gets uninjured and healthy and we'll see where he's at. That's, a really good point that you can't really argue with. As you were talking, I looked up the rankings here, and I, I this is the pound for pound rankings. They've got Kamara Usman at 15, so he's still ranked. Max Holloway, Tom Aspinall, Aljamain Sterling, Sean Strickland, Adesanya, Pantoja, Dricker Duplessis, O'Malley, Oliveira, Pereira, Edwards, Volk, John Jones, Makachev at one. Um, I guess. I mean, I was surprised. This is no disrespect to Usman. I was kind of surprised to see his name on there. I guess mm-hmm. he only lost, well, to Hamza and Leon Edwards. Right. Um, but the real question I wanted to ask you is not about that. Is you know, so, so for Jamal there, he's got a chip on his shoulder. Yeah. Right. It's good. And when I, yeah, well, that's where I'm going. That's my question because when I was fighting, my God, I had a giant chip on my shoulder. I had potentially you might call it a, a, a victim complex. I always thought the world was against me. Everyone's trying to get me down. And it was one man's fight to just take on the world. Mm-hmm. And when you're fighting in a sport like mixed martial arts or boxing, that kind of approach and that kind of mentality is so, in some ways, because whatever it takes, whether it's negative energy or positive energy, if that fuels you and gets you out of bed because you want to prove the world wrong, like I always wanted to prove the critics wrong, the people that write these little articles or the assholes on Twitter and all the rest of it, that shit is your friend yeah. when you're fighting. Yeah. So it's funny that you say that because, uh, you know, Jamal is a, is a super emotional. I don't want to say emotional. He's a very honest person he's very uh, i don't know he kind of wears his heart on his sleeve like you see these quotes like he's not afraid to say how he feels and tell people how you know how they pissed him off so we've had these conversations and and he, you can tell like he takes things very personal like things that maybe other people wouldn't have taken so personally he does and it pisses him off and he feels like it's a personal attack on him and i don't argue with him like i just let him because i think it's good for him like mm-hmm. I think it's good for his recovery. I think it's good for his his rehab. It's good for his return to the octagon. So like if he says, "Man, these guys are sleeping on me. They they think I'm done." Like I know like Jamal nobody thinks that. Nobody in the world thinks you're done or you're washed up or you're not good enough. Nobody in the division certainly thinks that. So maybe they're just enjoying the time that you're away and and that's what happens when you're injured and you're out for a while. The, the rest of the division moves on. People move on. You're not in the conversations and, and it's not fun. But instead of me explaining that to him, let's let him think it because it's mm. good for him. It's good, it's good for his mental. It's good for his motivation. It gets him up in the morning. Like some well, people are, best. some people I want to be the best in the world. And some people are like, I want to, I want to sh- I'll f- show you. Sometimes that yeah. mentality is better than, you know, the other one. Well that, well, that that's it. That that encapsulates it perfect. That attitude of "I'll show you," mm-hmm. I'll, sh-, and if you really mean it, regardless of what it is in this life, you know what I mean. If you've yeah. got that mentality where you're going to f- prove everyone wrong, you oh, I got a me. question for you. I got a question for I'm you. Gonna f- show you, and you can ask me because my face is going red about a second because no one alive <laughs> should interrupt me halfway <laughs> through a speech. No, no, this is this fits right in. Yeah, I know. It's, well, lo- it's the red wallpaper behind me. It's got to be. I, did, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I got to get this no, out. No, no, I'm joking. How can out. I say that? So How can I say that? I uh, A lot of people will always tell you when you're trying to push towards the title. or I, I get told this all the time. Stop trying to prove people wrong. Prove, try to prove yourself right. Try to make, prove the people that support you, the your family, your friends that have been behind you the whole time. Prove them right. Don't worry about proving everyone else wrong that like it's more motivating for me to just want to piss off the haters so my question to you is did you 
at, uh, of course, after you won the title, uh, eventually you do, you, you're going to think about your family and your friends and you're going to love everyone that supported you and thank them. But was the first thought when you were walking back to the, to the back in the, in the lock, excuse me, the locker room. I mean, like, did you think about every single mean tweet, Instagram message, trash talking media personality? Like every time I win a fight where everyone says I wasn't supposed to, I cannot wait to throw it in their face. You know, I'll take screenshots on my phone of shit that people say on the internet and I'll save them. And then after the fight, I'll send them back to them. Well, when I knocked out Luke Rockhold and became champion of the world, the Mm -hmm. first, never mind walking back. The first thing that I did was jump on top of the octagon and point at Luke Rockhold. And it wasn't aimed at Luke Rockhold. It was aimed at the world. I went, you. And it was Mm -hmm. you to everyone that talked shit online that wrote your little articles that didn't believe that laughed that mocked as it are and posted your little ufc 100 gifts do you know what i mean that yeah. was yeah i pointed at rock but that was directed at all of those people because no one knows what you're capable of better than you you know what yep. i mean deep down inside yourself you know what you're capable of everyone listening to this knows exactly what they can and can't do i think if you're honest with yourself and, and you're realistic you know what you can achieve and you have a feeling and you have a vibe you're like i know i can do this i know i can become champion and people laugh at you and people mock you and people that are listening to this whatever it is that they're into they know how far they can go and if you speak that into existence they laugh and they talk shit and they giggle and they get with the friends and they go, have you heard this guy, what he says he wants to do because he's right. got an ambition. Do you know right. what I mean? And yeah, everyone said all that shit. So that's why I jumped on top of the ring and I went, you, but that was to the world, baby. And mm-hmm. it was the best feeling ever. That's that, that's that chip. That's that chip on the shoulder that I just let Jamal have. Cause I got the same thing. I, I'm not this like, I'm just so motivated to be the best in the world. And I just want like, that i'm of course that's true but also when shit's deep and dark and hard it feels really good to shut people the fuck up it's the best feeling it is. no 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 but, but like is. like for all the victories i had in the octagon like going out there and beating someone really quick that's that that's awesome that's great mm-hmm. you know you look like the man and you get those highlight reels and i didn't have too many of them because i wasn't like a one punch knockout guy but there yeah, you know i had quite a few knockouts the ones i'm more proud of are the hard fought victories the one where you had to really fight through adversity like the fight with anderson silver do you know what yeah. i mean my face was covered in blood at the end of it and the fact i was able to fight through and get get to the final bell and still win and people can sit here and go oh, you lost that fight i didn't lose that fight if you know how to score mixed martial arts right. but i'm more proud of those victories because yeah. you gotta fight for it. you gotta dig deep and you gotta f- will yourself still into the fight you know so well, winning it and taking it are different oh yeah. like going in and winning a fight just because you're the better guy of course that's great but then like your fight with anderson like you guys are in a power struggle like you're not going to be able to just win that fight with him at that point but you had to take it mm. and that's incredible like that's the that's inspiring shit i just suck it out of his soul <laughs> <laughs> hey a win's a win hey but well, however you're gonna get this done yeah. baby 20 bucks is 20 bucks <laughs> <laughs> uh talking of sucking it out of your soul uh um harrington you put this in the notes about vaping <laughs> and I'm wondering- <laughs> segue of the year what's up oh, baby. um uh, yeah, so this is actually kind of interesting. So the UK is passing laws. Uh, you remember last year they they said they have this whole initiative where they want uh, no more smokers, but I think it was like the 2040 or something like that, or anyone born in 2009 and beyond, uh, they, they never want them to smoke. Uh, so the UK is passing laws. Uh, measures include restricting the flavors they can sell. Uh, they want a plainer packaging and they're modifying the store displays. So it doesn't look like happy fun time. Grab a vape from us. Um, so that's the idea is to, you know, essentially stop marketing these things to children. Now, I know Brian doesn't like any form of government control I whatsoever. No, you don't. And Brian, I get that. Brian wanted to sell cigarettes to kids just to keep the government out of I feel like it. this is a good thing. Right. Call me liberal left-leaning dickhead of the year liberal getting left hook, <laughs> left hook larry <laughs> blue <laughs> I'll 
liberal Larry. <laughs> Call me liberal Larry. <laughs> We're gonna get a T-shirt. Oh, you want? You want getting kids addicted to mm. luminous green, pink, and blue vape sticks that are gonna be bad for you, right? That are flavored cranberry blue Raz Jazz, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they're called, but at this on, point. Right? I'm all about the Darwinian philosophy in this. If you smoke, if you vape your lungs out of your body, that that's just uh, natural selection. We don't have predators anymore. We need dumb shit like this to take out the the low hanging fruit. If you suck the soul out of your own body through it, <laughs> right? You raz vape pen. <laughs> Excuse me. I don't think it's a bad deal. But let's not market dangerous yeah. shit to kids. Of course, of course. I I think it helps people stop smoking and stuff like that, and that's great. But just not making it, uh, you know, so attractive to children. Yeah, that's got to be a good thing. I had a segue where we were going to go with that in just a second, but it's totally slipped my mind. Brian, if you want to give us some more government conspiracy stuff, <laughs> whilst it comes back to me, or Anthony, do you have anything else intelligent to offer on the matter? I, no, I really don't. I just think I I don't see it. I don't have any arguments. You I, want to talk about where your money is really going instead no. of Ukraine? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Come on, then, Brian. Oh, this you is gonna, shed some light this on is... the YouTube video that you watched this morning, and you went down into the comment section and into oh, the rabbit come hole, on. and then ended up on. Uh, what, what, what's it called? What's it called? 4chan? 4chan. No, I Brian, mean, Brian I, learned it on Reddit. I don't, ha I don't have a Reddit account or a 4chan account. Just still uh, that's a lie. I swear to God. You don't have a Reddit account? I got rid of you're it not years even, ago. You're not even I American. got rid of it years ago. You're not even American then. All right. You're not a real conspiracy theorist. Right. Uh, well, a man without a Reddit. country then. Do I have a Reddit account? I don't know, but what's 4chan? What what is that? 4chan is where the uh, the funny people hang out on the internet. The funny, um, it's like the, so the dark web. A lot <laughs> of the dumb shit that shows up in pop culture has started as like a troll on 4chan. You know how everybody's like, "This is a white supremacist symbol now." Mm -hmm. That started yeah. at that started on 4chan. It was literally a, a bunch of bunch of just trolls on the internet made this rumor up put it out and now the news is reporting on it and there's a, a pile of things that 4chan has invented that the the like the public narrative have just run with is real that's crazy yeah it's so well, funny so you have a 4chan i thought it was 4champ shows. no i don't have a 4chan account either I, I, why not yeah because i because i'm i would be a bad person I think. i'm gonna google 4chan 4chan, no. let's see what comes up. 4chan, Wikipedia. It says here, 4chan is an anonymous English language image board website launched by Christopher Moot Poole in 2003. The site hosts boards dedicated to a wide variety of topics from video games and television to literature, cooking, weapons, music, history, anime, fitness, politics, and sports. Sounds great. Amongst others, registration is not available and users typically post anonymously. As of 2022, 4chan receives more than 22 million unique visitors monthly. Jeez. Approximately half are from the United States. What's wrong with that? Yeah, it sounds really nice when you write it out on yeah. paper and you're like, hey, everybody, it's just a website. But it's where, all, it's, it's where all the trolling starts. Literature, cooking, music, yeah. Here, history, right, anime. I have, a, I, have a, I have some homework for you, Mike. After this show, you're going to create a 4chan account. And then throughout the next week, just periodically, I want you to go in and just scan through the threads in different, you know, different areas on that on that site. You, and then, so and then report anonymous. back to us on Monday. You don't make an account. You can just go on it. Oh, you don't, can't make an account. No, and it gives your posts like, uh, like, like it's a, a serial number. number. Yeah. yeah. You, you don't need to do that. We were talking about this recently. The for you thing on Twitter, that's going to be the wildest thing on the web right now yeah. oh man get ready you're right. about to drop off a shelf in the ocean okay when you, when you hop onto 4chan one question if i take my computer in to be repaired am i gonna get like be careful you know, with stuff that you click on in FBI 4chan. Finds yeah, you, have, you have to be very careful, very careful when you're click. clicking around i'd probably do it from 4chan. your phone i'd probably do it from your phone i'd probably do it on a new computer and then burn it afterwards. Are you advising <laughs> me to buy a computer for my secret web browsing for inappropriate websites and then you telling me how to hide you, them? You can accidentally become a felon on 4chan. 
well, I don't want to do that then. Homework or not, <laughs> it's the best excuse ever. Sir, I'm sorry, I didn't want to become a bloody... It's for the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was for the podcast. <laughs> My producer said to do it, sir. Yeah. Uh, all right, Harrington, give us a bloody uh, subject so we can stop talking bloody nonsense. Okay, uh, how about this one? Uh, Jerry Cannonier uh, gave a timeline for his return. Uh, if you remember, he he was offered a, a number of very interesting fights that he had to pass on because he had to have MCL surgery. Uh, he says you should be ready to go, uh, ready to start training again by the end of March. And he has one name on his mind for a return sometime in the summer, Hamzat Chemayev. Mm. Uh, he says that, you know, obviously the title is what he would like to be fighting for. But short of that, this is the next best opportunity to to solidify your title chances, especially fighting lower in the rankings. See, I absolutely love that. And shout out to Jared Cannon here because how many people are calling out Hamza? I know there's people in the past that have done that, but for Jared Cannonier to be in the position that he is, to mm -hmm. have a win over the former champion Strickland, a man that's at the top of the food chain, although he's not the champion or contending for it anytime soon, top five, has been for a long, long time, and one good win or two good wins, he's right there. To call out Hamzat Chimeev is a gangster move because Hamzat's calling everyone out. Mm -hmm. He's got shit call outs to Pereira, Duplessis, Tom Aspinall, John yeah. Jones. I mean, the <sighs> list, John Jones. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, John yeah Jones. you're right. You're right. Um, I, I love that for Cannoneer because I think that's what he needs because he's not the huge personality guy. I actually really enjoy talking to him. Um, mm. I think he's really, really intelligent. He's super smart, but he's not... He's not out there like that on social media or doing interviews or or whatever. So he's he has to get it just strictly off of his merits and his his abilities. Um, and and Hamza's the guy. You get a win over Hamza, you're probably going to be in line for a title. That's just where you think Hamza is in the division. And how many 85ers he has or hasn't fought, whatever. The the truth of it is, is that Dana promised him a title shot if he beat Kamara Usman, but he was injured. And now he's kind of in this weird kind of floating around spot. We know how the, the the UFC moves quickly. They move around stuff and things change. But at one point in time, he was told he was next for a title shot with a win over Kamar Usman. You go beat that guy and as popular as uh, Hamzat is, uh, that's probably enough. And also for Hamzat, right? Because everybody points to the same thing. Whenever Hamzat says he should get a title fight, when any... Anytime anybody says or suggests that, they turn around and say, well, who's he beating at middleweight? That is what everybody says. That is, And, mm -hmm. and there's some validity to that argument, right? There is, there is. any way you slice it. Um, so for him, beating Jared Cannonier, a perennial contender that's been there for a long time, who is top of the food chain, that shuts that box up. And for mm -hmm. Jared Cannonier, a win over Hamzat Chimeyev, is a big, big thing. It's right. a big deal. To yeah, your point, you said one. you said Jared's not out there. I love Jared Cannonier. He's amazing. He's been on this podcast a few times. Mm -hmm. He's the crystal master. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He loves his crystals. He's getting he the power from the dark magic. Him and black Rashad. Magic. Yeah, him and Rashad. Jared Black Magic Cannonier. <laughs> that sounds racist, but it's not. <laughs> I'm not talking about his skin color. Uh, yeah. He loves the crystals. He harnesses the energy. He does. He does. I've I've seen him and Rashad talk at the Apex before. Oh God, um, I could only imagine. Oh yeah, I was like, kind of just standing there with my hands in my pockets, like I don't know what the fuck you guys are talking about, but it sounds interesting. Just try and break it down. What they were talking about. Um. Well, they were talking about a lot of well, some of the some of the crystal energy stuff, but they talk about a lot of love, which I think is interesting. It's really interesting. Yeah. They're both, they both are like real big on this love thing. They're kind of, I don't know. They remind me of like hippies from the seventies. Like they're, everything's about love and passion and how, and feelings, you know, like Rashad is like always digging into me about feelings. Like, how do you feel? How do you feel in this moment? Well, how did that make you feel? Like, I'm like telling him a story like, and then that said this, and he's like, <laughs> well, how did, how did that make you feel? Like I'm mad as a Rashad's what I'm trying to tell yeah. you. He's like, well, what exactly did he Why? say that touched that one feeling inside of you? You're like, Rashad, can I just be mad and just scream yeah. for a second? Then we can talk it out. You're not my therapist. We're bros. I'm telling you, I'm going to smash this <laughs> head in. <laughs> How did that make you feel? How did you it's like? Uh, uh, what feelings did those touch? If you, no, but if that's, you could talk but, about it. But that is Rashad and Jared by all accounts from what mm -hmm. you said there. Cause yeah. I've spoken to Jared a few times and not that in depth, but that's great. It's, it's, it's beautiful to see. It really it is. is. It makes me 
feel, I feel like I'm a a better person when I'm around Rashad and and uh, I'm sure Jared Cannonier is very very similar. It doesn't make, make, make me feel, like a, feel like a better person. It makes me. I think it highlights that Floss. I'm not a good person. <laughs> well, but I think once I'm once I've been around them for a while, you're like, well, like even when we're eating dinner, like we'll go out to eat and like. The, re- the, w- the the waitress will come over and say, uh, all right, get you guys ready to order? And Rashad will say, yeah. I'm like, Rashad, you go first. And he'll he'll order some shit that just sounds heavenly. I'm like, oh, I was just going to get a steak and some beers and some fries, but I better, I better think a little, I better think a little deeper into, into this meal choice. <laughs> How is this food brought to the table? He's, he's one of these just stop oil people, isn't it? Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. He has to be. I guarantee. Oh, we Is it brought on before. a bed of lettuce? Because I don't like porcelain. <laughs> we were talking about that before and we said we don't know much about it and we don't. But I am a bit of an expert now. I watched 15 minutes of a documentary called Poisoned the okay. other day on Netflix. Okay. Have you seen that? I haven't. I'm going to watch it. Well, I haven't seen it. I saw 15 minutes of it and I turned it <laughs> off because it got a bit boring. But there's some <laughs> shocking shit goes on from the food being grown to mm-hmm. getting onto your plate. It's disgusting. Yeah, in some places. Yeah, yeah, for sure. In America, for sure. It was in America. It was an American documentary. Well, you talk, you're talking about like big factory farming, though. Talking about big factory farming. Right. And then you got all the cows there together, really condensed, closed uh-huh. in. Yeah. And then right next to them, they're growing spinach and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And then all the, the cattle are shitting. And the shit goes into the water supply, mm-hmm. and that water is put into the sprinklers yep. for the spinach, mm-hmm. and it's it's a breeding ground for E. coli. That's why you don't eat spinach. You don't eat spinach? No, that's what my food eats. Bro, you don't like spinach? No. You don't put a handful of spinach in your protein shake? <laughs> no. Every no. day? No. If you can't get it from a from a steak or some <laughs> potatoes, I probably don't want it. Are you are you not a big vegetable eater? No, not at all. I can tell by that. I'm mainly the jaundice in your face. Yeah, I'm mainly uh <laughs> well, there we go. Less jaundice. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> you know we're struggling for content when this is the shit that we're coming out with. My God. Oh dear. Oh dear. Uh let's have a look here. Speaking of UFC 300, he wants in on that. Marab Devalashvili, we did that. Jalton Almeida, yeah. Oh, this is nice. Speaking of good, heartwarming stuff, Jalton Almeida made an athlete with Down syndrome with Down syndrome's dream come true, dropping a decision loss to the young handicapped man at a demonstration <laughs> fight. He was 14 years old. That's awesome. Well done to Jalton Almeida. Do we have a video of that? I do believe there is a link uh, right so there. What are you laughing at? What are you laughing at? What are you laughing at? <laughs> he didn't even let him get a finish? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he could he could have faked, faked a knockout. <laughs> he made him fight to a decision. <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to get into the later rounds. <laughs> it backfired on him. You couldn't get like a you couldn't give that that kid a third round like <laughs> yeah. I don't know guillotine or something like come you on. Couldn't, you couldn't give him on top of the <laughs> ring the <laughs> you moment. Oh, Look, at one point him. he's got him in a triangle. Does, hey, rap, does awesome. he tap? Oh, he did finish oh, it. Oh, he tapped. Oh, thank God. You okay, better that's hope better. Pray he doesn't meet John Jones. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's great. Well done, Jalen. No, that's made super that's cool. I love. Uh, I love. Uh, you know, Diego Sanchez did that one time too. Yeah. Uh, in uh, in Albuquerque, so I, I always think that's cool. I wish that they would call me and ask me to do something like that because I would jump all over it. I would as well, but I fear I might be the. You know what I wouldn't do? Person in. The- <laughs> <laughs> you know what I wouldn't do though? Go I'm on. not sure because I read this in the notes earlier. I'm not sure I'd give up a first class flight going out of the country, like overseas. What is that story? And Harrington, yeah. just because I do remember seeing something about yeah. that. Go ahead. Uh, so a man had a uh, he had first class tickets uh, to go to London, London, uh, New York to London. So like a five and a half ish hour flight. Uh, a woman uh, was talking about how it was her dream to one day fly first class. So this guy 
just jumped on the grenade, said, okay, let's, uh, let's go. You take my first class ticket. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll trade with you. And he let her sit in first class for the ride from New York to London. How many times do you think she's done this? I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to, that, that's it's just my dream. Yeah. My dream. Hey, first of all, fair play to that guy. Had to yeah. put it on social media though. Had to do it. Good for him. Uh, but if you are going to do something nice, don't put it on social media. Like these people that give money to mm-hmm. homeless people. When they go right. over to say, what do you need? What do you need? How about I give you $5,000? And then, and they film them and the guy cries. Uh, but that is nice. Um, I encountered very, something very similar to that once. I'd fought in Australia. I had Rebecca and the kids with me. We're flying back after the fight. I had a business class ticket because I was fighting. The family were in premium economy. Mm-hmm. And Rebecca, I, and, but I always, uh, I, I let Rebecca have the seat. So she mm-hmm. was in business class and I'd just gone up to see her. Oh, no, no, I'm lying. No, was the other way. Sometimes I do do that, but on this one I hadn't. Not every time. I, I was injured. I, I, I did a tough fight. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rebecca came up to see me. That's right, and she had Lucas, who was a newborn baby or like one or something. And this guy, uh, Indian fella, on the plane saw that she was sitting back there, and he goes, "If you want, you can have my seat." And she says, oh, "Excuse wow. me." He said, "Yeah, uh, so you guys can sit together because you got a baby. You can take my seat. I don't need this. You can have this one." And I was That's like, awesome. I was, she never took it. I'm like, babe, take you, the fucking seat. Yeah, take and you the were like, seat. don't take that seat. I ain't trying to listen you, to that baby this whole flight. So you're not having mine. <laughs> take yeah. the random guys. No, but isn't that a beautiful thing? It I is. Mean, that guy did it there. And this, this random stranger just offered his seat up to my wife. It's amazing. I love that. Yeah. I love yeah. I mean, That's a long flight too. That's a long, long flight. flight. That's a long oh, flight. Yeah. Uh, five yeah. hours. I I didn't really, really think about how far the New York to London flight is. I could probably give up a first class flight for five hours. Any longer than that, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to close my eyes and pretend like I don't see anybody. And I lived in England at the time as well. Australia to England, that's one of the longest flights you can do. You got to make a stop off somewhere along the way. But yeah, but yeah so you, uh, you wouldn't do that. That was a nice segue though, Anthony. I thought so. I thought it was pretty good. I'm glad that you yeah. pointed it out. Thank you for that. I know. <laughs> You're coming for the title. All right, today's episode is sponsored by 8Sleep, and I'm telling you right now, I absolutely love this device. It is the high-tech solution to the age-old sleeping problem. You're too hot. Your wife's too cold, okay? You have little arguments, right? This perfect thing just sits on top of your mattress like a mattress cover, and you can control the, the temperature. One side, you can have it as low as 55 degrees. The other side can be as warm as 110 degrees. And it's not just about comfort. It's about the quality of sleep that you're going to get, okay? Science has shown that in order for you to sleep your best, the body temperature needs to drop in the early and the middle part of sleep, and then it needs to rise in the morning. So the pod cover will improve your sleep by automatically adjusting your bed's temperature based on your individual needs. The cover can be added to any bed, as I said, just like a fitted sheet and allows you and your partner to cool or warm your side of the bed and allows you not to have those stupid arguments when you're tossing and turning in the night. It's too hot. It's too cold. Is the heating on? Turn the air conditioning off and all that type of stuff. That's the thing of the past. The eight sleep just slips onto your bed and you'll be happy as Larry. So there's no better way to improve your day than improving your sleep. And the easiest way to do that is with the eight sleep pod three. Start the new year right and invest in the rest. You deserve the absolute best. So what are you waiting for? Get the eight sleep pod cover. Look, all cheesy ad reads aside, this thing is fantastic. I stand by this. I'm very proud to have one of these. And you will be glad if you take advantage of this pretty significant offer. Right now, go to 8sleep.com slash Bisping and you will receive $200 off plus free shipping on the pod cover by 8sleep. One more time, 8sleep.com slash Bisping for $200 off and free shipping. Um, we got fights this weekend. We have uh, a great main event and a great call main event. And we'll have things to talk about. Breakdown, digress. We'll have another show for you Thursday. Do me a favor, everybody. Do me a favor. Hopefully you like the show. Been a bit random today. I've enjoyed myself. I've had a good yeah. time. If you have also, hit that subscribe button. Come on, do your bit. You got the content. Do us a favor. Hit subscribe. But if you have a question to ask us, send it into bympod at gmail.com. 
And if you're listening on Spotify, where you find podcasts, make sure to subscribe. Leave us a five-star rating, positive review. It really helps us out on those platforms. As Mike said, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the channel and you hit that notification bell to find out whenever a new video drops. And if you want to catch over 500 episodes you can't find anywhere else, completely ad-free and totally uncensored, head to gasdigital.com. Use the promo code BYM. Get a seven-day free trial and check out over 20 great shows on the network. All right. First question we got here today is from Mr. John Miller. Hi, this is Joe from March for the Mask. My question is, why haven't Bisping and Anthony Smith asked to be the next Ultimate Fighter coaches? I think it would be an entertaining season and help bring the show back to what it was the first couple of seasons. And I think instead of uh, fighting at the end of this season, you could just have an arm wrestling match. So I think it'd be a good idea. Thank you. How fun would that be? Hold on, hold on. I was having audio issues. I don't know about you. It was very low. It was hard to hear. So what did he say? He said, how come we haven't suggested that me and you coach the next season of the Ultimate Fighter? Together? To, no, against each other. And then at the end, instead of fighting, we have like an arm wrestling competition. I would argue about what we do at the end. We could we could make it way more fun than arm wrestling. We, 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 could, we could do more than arm I'll put the gloves on. Well, no. I'll have a demonstration. I'll have a, no, I'll have an exhibition no. bout. No. What? What do you mean? No. Well, you think I can't do it? You think <laughs> I can't what it takes? You think I can't? He's like, no, don't be silly. No, no. Listen, like, no, listen. But it's okay, Mike. Listen. No, there's guy. no reason to fight. We can have fun. Why? We're, we're, we're not like we're gonna talk shit during the show. I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> prank you. I'm gonna fuck with your team. I'm gonna bother you, but it's gonna be lots of laughs and some fucked up shit. And then at the end, we can like do a shot competition or something. Just see who stays awake the longest. Sign me up for all of that. I've got a better idea. Okay. Podcast coaches. So it's me and you as mm-hmm. one team. Yeah. And the other team is like, I don't know, John Anik and Kenny Florian. Oh, Kenny Florian. We'll yeah. fuck them up. Yeah. Right. Matt Sarah. Brendan Sharp. And, yeah. Brendan Sharp and um, um, Brian Callen. Yeah. Matt yeah, Sarah and what's his partner called? Jimmy Norton. Jim Norton. Yeah, Jim Norton. Yeah, that'd be fun. I think we'd them all up. I think we definitely f- them all up for sure. Are you guys planning on fighting the other MMA podcast? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> for sure. For I'm sure. in. I, I think I'd we have win a tough, that hands down. Now I'd have a tough time with John Anik and Ken Flo, though. I'd have a hard Easiest time. Easiest f- payday ever. <laughs> 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 but I like them so much. Oh, no, I don't no, know. No, I just no. I just pick up John and put him in my pocket or something and just I was gonna say, no, over. you're having Kenny Florian. That's the harder fight. Kenny's legit and shout out Kenny. I, I, would, I, I, I love those guys. I'd have an easier time fighting Kenny than John, that's for sure. <laughs> no, no, they're both awesome. And Kenny is the absolute man and a legend of mixed martial arts Absolutely. as well. So thank you, by the way, Kenny, for last week. That's why you're at, you're having Kenny and I'll take John. Okay. okay? That's a deal. That's All a real right. Matt Sarah and Jim Norton up for sure. How would he? Matt Sarah's got some power, bro. Yeah. Okay. Then when we fight Brennan Schaub and Brian Callen, you can take Schaub. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> Not Big Brown. <laughs> I ain't having Big Brown. I'll take. I'll take them both on. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. 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 What, a, what a fun okay. question. That I like that one. Yeah. I would like to coach the Ultimate Fighter. Though. Me and you, tag team as coaches. That'd be sweet. Yeah. That'd, that'd be, be awesome. Fun. Just no Moscow mules in straws. No Moscow mules. Well, wait, wait, wait. And, and no applying chapstick on the show either. So when I apply chapstick, I, I, I'm going to say this. I get, I get, I get chapped when I'm talking. I, I do. So put it on. I, I just, I, I, even in front of my own wife, I don't like applying chapstick. Really? Yeah. Oh, I do it all the time, everywhere in public. I, 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 I kind of do this, like. <laughs> Is it weird? Yeah. I, yeah, I just, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I feel like I'm putting lipstick on, but it's an, it's essential in dry air. It, it is. When I was okay, well, outside I'll, it. Well, I'll take it easy on the chapstick on the podcast. <laughs> I'm like, is he making moves on me? Is he playing his <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brian, what else have we got? <laughs> you Next muted, question buddy. we have is from Jesse. What's up, BYM crew? Jesse from North Idaho, just the tip. Um, had a question for Bisping and Anthony being pro fighters. This is something I'm really curious about. Uh, we have a lot of King of the Cage events up where I live. And uh, I've noticed that a few of the guys there, they never announce their records. 
they'll announce their name but not their records um so i did some research and a lot of those guys have like four wins and like 20 losses or something crazy like that um i'm curious like what's up with guys like that do they just go in there and throw fights or do they just not train and enjoy fighting and don't care and uh as like if you're an aspiring young fighter what would it do to your career to lose to a kind of guy like that oh and one last thing not a man alive runs a podcast like michael bishwing and harrington in the most loving way possible fuck you yep love that Anthony, guy. first take um well i expected him to have way more of a uh a redneck hick accent by the looks of yeah. him he started talking like oh wow he's educated okay um no I, there is a lot that's how the regional scene is especially in the midwest or or, or these northern states like there's uh i don't think they're not throwing fights and they're a lot of them are training they're just not very good and they fight all the time a lot of them are really gritty super tough veterans that are really tough fights for everybody um but in the end you'll probably end up getting over on one of those guys if you're any good um but those guys have to exist these up and comers that they need to go through a couple guys like that because you know they can fight guys that aren't very good but now you got to start moving them into guys that are super tough that are really crafty veterans that aren't maybe necessarily super skilled or athletic but can figure <laughs> out ways to win that, that have done it a bunch of times like you need those guys in the progression of young up and comers so they're necessary um and some guy and they just like going out there they know they're never going to make it to a big show but they love fighting they like training make a little bit of little bit of cash on the side and and some of these guys look at it like a part-time job. Um, yeah. So that's how I look at it. Um, uh, I, I think those guys are absolutely necessary. And, and honestly, those guys have some of the harder, have harder roads than a lot of the people that make it into the UFC. Some of those guys' paths are really, really difficult. 100% totally agree with everything you said. And the journeyman, right? That's what you call them. In the boxing mm -hmm. world, that's where that term comes from. The guys that lose all the time. And I guess in boxing, they're almost expected to lose. So it's a little bit different. But those guys that are doing that, they're still stepping out there. They're some of the toughest bastards on planet Earth. Yeah. You know, just because they have those records, don't let that fool you. Yeah, okay, some of them just suck. Maybe, right. right? Probably some of them. But some of them are, are really good as well. But mentally, they are some of the toughest people that you'll find yeah. because do you know how hard it is to walk out there when you keep losing fights? Yeah, it's hard. And just still keep trying. And like when I did Tales from the Octagon, I talked about Tony Ferguson fighting Paddy Bimbler. And I was like, yeah, Tony Ferguson has lost six in a row, right? Do you know how hard it is to continue fighting when you've lost six in a row? And I, yeah. I, I broke it down like this. I said, imagine if you were – going down your local pub, right? And there's this guy, someone's talking shit, and you say, right, get outside, let's go. So you go outside, and you have a fight, and you get the shit kicked out of you in front of everyone. And the whole town is laughing. You're in a small little town. Everyone talks shit. Everyone's laughed. And the, the black eyes heal and all the rest of it, and you crawl out your, your hole, you know, and you come back to the pub, and people are like, oh, uh, here he is, showing his <laughs> face again. And then a couple of weeks later, someone's talking shit, and you go, right, this outside let's go again <laughs> and you get battered again you get kicked to shit right imagine you do that again and again and again and again <laughs> people would think you were crazy <laughs> this is what I'm saying. tony ferguson's crazy do you know what i mean right. these people are crazy do you know what i mean and they are very very mentally strong do you yeah. know what i mean except it's not down your local pub it's mm -hmm. in front of twenty thousand people in las vegas with millions of people watching all <laughs> over the planet <laughs> on pay-per-view <laughs> on pay-per-view you've got <laughs> not only is it a bar people paid to watch it <laughs> <laughs> yeah you've trained <laughs> yeah do you know and what you I were mean? supposed to be ready exactly yeah that's those people and if you look at some of those guys records like especially on the regional scene i've seen i wish i could remember his name because i talk about this all the time he was like five and 19 right and one of my friends in colorado got offered to fight him and i was he was like yeah the dude's five and 19 i was like yeah fight him he was like i'm not fighting that guy i'm like why why would you not fight that guy pulled up his record all 19 guys had been in the ufc he didn't have a oh. loss to a guy that wasn't a ufc vet so like in his win, he had like two wins over UFC vets. So like, that's a deceiving record. 
Mm. And and just to your point there as well, you can't underestimate these guys. No. And what I'm going to say might sound a little bit disrespectful because I'll mention him by name, but it's not designed to be. An old training partner of mine, and he kicked my ass from when I moved out of here in 2011 to when I retired from fighting. He was my main training partner, Moses Marietta, brilliant boxer, high-level jiu-jitsu, not the best wrestler, but decent wrestling, always in shape. He could hit hard. He had a chin. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And he pushed me every single session. And I wouldn't have been the fighter that I was without him in my training camps pushing me. And sadly, I don't know what his record is now. He just couldn't put it together. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, on the, the lower level shows. Yeah. whether it was nerves or whatever it was, you know what I mean? But that doesn't mean the guy couldn't fight because I know for uh, if I, I was champion of the world and he was coming into a gym on a Tuesday morning and whooping my ass, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Just because he was losing down at the OC Fairground, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Doesn't mean he's not to be respected. Yeah, you know? I talk so, about this all the time. The toughest people I've ever, ever that I've ever encountered in this sport are not guys I fought. They're guys that beat yeah. the f- out of me in the gym. Yeah. Like it, yeah. Like like Cody Brundage. I talk about this all the time. Match Cody up with anybody in the UFC 185 and bring him down to Factory X in Inglewood, Colorado, and he'll run with every single one of those guys. For whatever reason, up to this point, you run him in the when the bright lights are on and and it really matters. At up to this point, he's he struggled a little bit, but uh, you run every one of them dudes in some broke dick gym anywhere in the country, and he'll be right there with them all. Yeah, yeah. That's and wild. if you go down a dark alley. It's one yeah. of those guys that you want with you. Let me tell you <laughs> exactly. that. Exactly. And, and and that's why that's why people always say to me about my kids, you know, Callum and, and Lucas, mm-hmm. are they going to fight? And I say, I always say, I don't think so. And I don't want them to. Not because I don't think they could. It's because actually making it, actually making money and turning this into a, a career with longevity that's going to, reward you for all the time and effort that you put in. Listen, we all know how hard it is. I don't even need to mm-hmm. go into that. The sacrifice and the, the training and the injuries and all the rest of it, but just the time alone and not the, the, the like the years. It's a lifetime. It's right. a lifetime. And for a lot of people, for, for a very select few guys that are lucky enough like me and you, and obviously with the UFC, there's a lot of, uh, lo- a lot more of us, but for a lot of people, they don't get that. And they're still, mm-hmm trying to make it happen. And sadly, they get to a point where they're too far into it. They're too far gone. Yeah, There's nothing else they can do now because they're in the 30s and they've mm-hmm. wasted the best years of their life. That's why sometimes when I see some fighters that are, are decent, but they say, nah, I'm, I'm stopping this. I'm going to go do something else. You respect I don't that. think, I, I don't say, ah, oh, this guy could have cut it. I think that's a smart right there. Yeah. But he's yeah, still I've young enough. He's young yeah. enough to, to, to build something else. To reinvent yourself. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I agree. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a good question. And I mm-hmm. think that's a good spot to end the episode. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Anthony. Yeah. This was fun. I'm glad we did yeah, this. I, yeah. It was, it was a fun. bit of a silly one, but I enjoyed yeah. it. I enjoyed myself. And we hope you did too, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for supporting the show. Take care. See you on Thursday.